Well, welcome, everybody. My name is Peter Frumhoff, um, and I'm pleased to have you join us today for a Science Network webinar on Facing Our Climate Future with Courage, the IPCC 1.5 Degrees C Special Report. Very pleased to have you with us today. Uh, I'm the Director of Science and Policy and Chief Climate Scientist at the Union of Concerned Scientists, and I'm joined today with two UCS colleagues, uh, Alden Meyer, our Director of Strategy and Policy, and Dr. Rachel Licker, a senior climate scientist uh, uh, in our climate and energy program. Uh, and while none of us are authors of this particular report, all of us have been engaged either as lead authors of IPCC reports or contributors to them, and certainly as translators of their findings into the policy context, both nationally and internationally, in which um, the IPCC findings uh, uh, live into. Uh, and um, so we have uh, up to an hour today. We're going to walk through um, both some context for the IPCC report, some key findings. This is not intended to be exhaustive, but rather to enable all of us to wrestle with key issues that the report uh, brings to our collective attention. Uh, uh, and we'll follow our relatively brief presentations with some uh, Q&A. Uh, you'll see a Q&A function on your screen, I hope. Uh, please feel free to um, submit questions in real time, uh, and uh, we will then come back to them and answer as many as we can uh, during the Q&A portion, portion of this uh, webinar. So with that, let me just uh, um, note, as I think you all know, uh, that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, 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 finalized a report uh, uh, after a, a complicated week-long plenary session with government policymakers uh, in South Korea in early October, finalizing the summary for policymakers of the report. Uh, and um, uh, we and many others helped uh, create the context in which that report was translated into forms available and accessible to the media and to policymakers and the broader public. So to share a little bit about the context for this report before digging into the findings of it, I'm going to turn this over now to uh, my colleague, Alden Meyer. Thanks, Peter. Um, I'm Alden Meyer, Director of Strategy and Policy for UCS and co-director of our Washington, D.C. office. Let me just say I think this will cover ground that many of you are already familiar with, but just to make sure that we're all grounded in the context for this important report. Uh, the goal associated with the Rio Framework Treaty in 1992, uh, the ultimate objective of that treaty was to avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system, uh, but there was no quantified goal in the Rio Treaty. Uh, since the Copenhagen Conference in 2009, there's been agreement among countries that the goal should be to not exceed an increase of 2 degrees Celsius in global average surface temperature above pre-industrial levels. Uh, one of the real breakthroughs in Paris was getting agreement to set a new goal, and it's up on the slide here, uh, holding the increase in global average temperature to well below 2 degrees C and pursuing efforts to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial levels. Uh, now, that was a, a, an aspirational goal, which was fought for very uh, fiercely by the small island states, the least developed countries, the international NGO community, and at the end was joined by the European Union, the U.S., and other developed countries as well. I think it's fair to say at the beginning of the Paris uh, Climate Summit, a few thought that anchoring a 1.5 degree aspirational goal in the agreement was possible. Uh, the second quote here is, is sort of giving that some life about what that means. Uh, and this was a very tricky part of the negotiations. If you, if you read this, it basically calls for net zero emissions uh, by mid-century in the second half of the century. Uh, but that term was fiercely opposed by Saudi Arabia and some other countries. And so we fell back on some language that had been used in previous IPCC reports that had been approved by governments as a way forward. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, in Paris, countries already recognized that the commitments, the so-called nationally determined contributions uh, that countries had put forward under Paris were not adequate to come anywhere close to the 2 degree C temperature limitation goal, much less get anywhere near the 1.5 degree uh, 
see goal. Uh, and they, in another part of the decision adopting the agreement, they estimated that uh, current uh, projections for 2030, if the NDCs were fully uh, implemented by countries, would result in global emissions of about 55 gigatons carbon equivalent and that emissions of no more than 40 gigatons in 2030 would be required to hold the increase in temperatures to no more than 2 degrees C, uh, and obviously less than that to get anywhere close to 1.5 degrees. And Peter will be talking in a minute about what the IPCC report says about emissions pathways. Now, the origins of the report itself uh, were in Paris, uh, and just to give you a little background here, uh, under Paris, we have five-year cycles for countries to uh, submit new nationally determined contributions and increase the ambition of their commitments. Uh, those new NDCs would not put, be put forward until starting in 2025. Uh, also, Paris calls for global stock-taking exercises every five years, two years in advance of those deadlines for tabling the new commitments. So the first global stock take will happen in uh, 2023. Uh, but because of the concern about the ambition gap uh, in Paris, uh, the commitments under Paris, countries agreed that they would hold a facilitative dialogue uh, at this year's climate summit, which will be held in Katowice, Poland. And the goal of that is to look at the uh, magnitude of the ambition gap and importantly at ways to close it. And as part of that, uh, countries invited the IPCC to produce uh, the special report as a centerpiece of the technical input to that dialogue. So now let me hand it over to my colleague, uh, Rachel Licker. Thank you so much, Alden. Um, I am now going to review some of the impacts uh, that were assessed in this report. The report covered a wide swath of impacts and how they differ between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius. So things from extreme heat and precipitation to effects on ecosystems and sea level rise. Um, I'm going to focus on these select illustrative impacts as an overview of, of some of the key findings. Um, but again, just wanting to note that this is not comprehensive because so much ground was covered. Um, with respect to extreme heat, the report found that, as with the past, the heat, uh, heat extremes respond directly to increases in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, as a result, heat extremes will only increase now uh, between now and 1.5 degrees C, and then between 1.5 and 2 degrees C. So the figure that you're seeing here shows a couple of different representations of changes in extreme heat that are examined in the report. Uh, the top figure shows how maximum daily temperatures are likely to change at 1.5 degrees C, so the top left panel, and 2 degrees C, the middle panel, as well as the difference between the two. Um, and the bottom shows how the number of hot days are likely to change at these two levels. Um, so, you know, what we're seeing here is with respect to absolute changes in temperature featured in the top, the mid-latitude regions are projected, and that would include, um, you know, countries like the United States, are projected to experience disproportionately large changes in extreme heat. Um, but when we look at things um, with respect to uh, days that are characterized as hot, so the top 10% warmest days, um, that's featured in the bottom figure, the tropics um, stand out as some of the regions that are likely to experience disproportionately large changes. Um, so what this will mean for people, uh, the report notes that 420 million more people are projected to be exposed to uh, an extreme heat wave once every five years at 2 degrees C than at 1.5 degrees C. So pretty stark differences even at um, between 1.5 and 2. The report also assessed uh, changes in extreme precipitation and found that risks um, of regions experiencing increases in extreme pre precip increase between 1.5 and 2C, um, although the report also noted that the projections are generally less robust than for temperature when you get into regional changes. Um, so the specifics of the findings were not quite as um, nuanced as they were for, for temperatures and extreme temperatures. 
Um, however, the figure that I'm showing you here from the report shows that the projected changes in heavy precipitation, um, which are represented as the percent change in annual uh, maximum five-day precip, um, shows that um, in for, for many regions they're likely to see uh, an increase in the intensity of these kinds of events um, with some, some difference at 1.5 and 2C. Um, with respect to extreme precipitation, uh, the report assessed that some regions are likely to be disproportionately affected. Uh, those include high latitude regions, uh, including Alaska, Northern Europe, Northern Asia, mountainous regions, uh, including the Tibetan Plateau, Eastern Asia, including uh, China and Japan, and Eastern North America. Uh, the report also touches upon the extreme precipitation associated with tropical cyclones. Uh, and similar to the IPCC ER5 and Climate Science Special Report, assess that tropical cyclones are expected to intensify with heavier precipitation. Um, with respect to changes in ecosystems, there were many, many different uh, uh, ecosystem types uh, and, and figures presented, but um, one of the most notable findings uh, that you all likely heard in the news reporting of, the, of this um, is that a large portion, 70 to 90 percent of warm water corals that exist today are likely to disappear at 1.5 degrees C warming, and virtually all are likely to disappear at 2 degrees C warming. Um, some of the other uh, findings with respect to ecosystem changes that were noted, um, approximately 7% of the global biome, um, or I'm sorry, 7% of global biomes are likely to transform at 1.5 degrees C, and uh, nearly double, 13%, are likely to transform at 2 degrees C. Um, and as I said before, the report also provides more specific ecosystem figures, um, including the high risks that are likely uh, to be witnessed in the Asian desert, the Australian rainforest, and African wetlands. The fact that the Central uh, American rainforest is likely to see a 20% loss of the ecosystem at 1.5 degrees C, and another 10% putting the figure at 30% loss at 2 degrees Celsius. Um, the report also noted stark uh, changes likely for insect species. Uh, three times as many insect species could lose more than 50% of suitable habitat at 2 degrees C than 1.5 degrees C. Um, another area that this report covered um, was sea level rise. So the Earth's sea level has already risen by about 7 or 8 inches since 1900. Um, the, this new report shows that in a 2 degrees C world, sea level rise it's projected to be about four inches higher than it would be in a 1.5 degree C world. And that number sounds small, but that's enough to expose an additional 10 million people around the world to risks from sea level rise by 2100. Um, however, a very important thing to note when considering these figures is that the report also um, highlights the, that ice sheet uh, instabilities could be triggered between 1.5 and 2 degrees C. Um, which could in turn trigger catastrophic sea level rise. So, um, you know, science is emerging in that area, uh, which will help to um, elucidate the, the probabilities and those dynamics, um, but that real risk was highlighted uh, in the report. So some of those figures could be conservative. Um, Again, as I mentioned, there are many other impacts assessed in this report. For example, that food security and uh, with respect to crop yields and nutritional quality of important cereal crops like wheat and rice are projected to progressively decline with increased warming. Um, so I could go on and I, I selected a few to give you a, a, a sense of the ground that was covered um, and encourage folks to check out the summary for policymakers or chapter three from the report to learn more. So with that, I am turning it back over to my colleague, Peter. All right, thank you, Rachel. Um, I want to just transition slightly and take a couple of slides that are actually not from the IPCC report to put the emissions and potential mitigation pathways in a little bit of context. Um, so this is actually from the Global Carbon Project, which regularly updates global uh, 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 estimates of carbon dioxide emissions and other uh, heat trapping emissions. This is a slide in particular uh, 
from this past year of the history since 1990 of global CO2 emissions on an annual basis from fossil fuel uh, use and indus industry, that is to say industrial sources. Just to remind you all of the pathway that we've been on, really since we've learned of the uh, serious risks of climate change broadly, 1990, uh, emissions have risen uh, and are on track to rise again this year. From fossil fuel uh, and industrial sources, we have slightly under 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide. That's a billion metric tons of carbon dioxide released every year. When you add on the emissions from land use change, that brings total annual emissions currently of carbon dioxide from anthropogenic sources to about 41 uh, a billion metric tons, gigatons. Um, uh, uh, so we have a long way to go to get to the net zero uh, target that Alden highlighted. Um, and we've had, um, again, to contextualize the impacts, we've had about a one degree Celsius warming so far based on the emissions that we've seen since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. And of course, that is projected to increase. The question is, what happens to our pathway of emissions? Where do we head from here? Um, and so uh, if you, this is also not from the IPCC report. But this is from something called Climate Action Tracker. Um, uh, if you look at that historic line, you'll see the number is slightly higher. It goes up to 50 gigatons, which is because this is looking at CO2 equivalent. That is to say, not only carbon dioxide emissions, but if we incorporate the contribution of emissions from methane and nitrous oxide, black carbon, other drivers of warming, we have the equivalent of roughly 50 gigatons of um, CO2 equivalent being uh, produced on an annual basis. And this just, again, to remind us, um, uh, countries made what were called nationally determined contributions in Paris, where they highlighted initial down payments on um, commitments to reduce emissions uh, intended to be uh, reviewed and re revisited and, one hopes, amplified in the context of the long-term goals of the Paris Agreement. If you just look at the um, kind of light blue portion of this, which is really what uh, what those pledges would get us to if, in fact, they're realized. And it's, so it's slightly just around 3 degrees Celsius uh, increase would be the rough um, estimate of the increase in warming that we would see if, in fact, countries live into the pledges uh, that they've made to date. Obviously, those need to be scaled up. But just to give you a sense that although the IPCC was tasked with looking at the difference between one and a half and two degrees, hence the focus of the impacts that Rachel just described. It's clear that um, you know two is not is not a ceiling in the sense that that the pathway that we're on. It's uh, as Alden highlighted. You know, until uh, until in Paris, it was considered uh, the guardrail, the floor, um, uh, and and clearly, um, uh, or rather, the ceiling that we should not go above. And clearly, the community of nations consistent with the observations of greater risks at lower temperatures that we're now seeing have have appropriately pushed this to uh, uh, one and a half degrees. Um, so what does that mean in practice if, in fact, we were to bring uh, emissions in line with the one and a half degree world? This is for now from the IPCC special report. This is focused on global net emissions of carbon dioxide. Um, and the blue range of emissions reductions pathways are pathways that the IPCC drew upon as models, integrated assessment model projections of how we might um, stay below uh, an increase of one and a half degrees um, with limited or no overshoot. That is to say, temperatures would not rise um, meaningfully above the one and a half degree target and then be brought back down. So we really wanted to keep temperatures with one and a half degrees at a ceiling. All of these pathways have some basic characteristics uh, uh, aligned with them. Uh, they all bring uh, global emissions of carbon dioxide to net zero by around 2050. Uh, and they all bring um, global emissions of carbon dioxide uh, reduced by about 45 to 50 percent from 2010 levels, which is the starting point on this graph, um, by about 2030. Of course, we're not at 2010 today. We're almost at 2020. Hence, the anticipation of the need for, consistent with this, um, with this temperature target, very dramatic, uh, rapid, and far-reaching transitions 
associated with a one and a half degree uh, world. We have a very limited carbon budget within which to play. Um, and the gray section of this figure simply highlights that um, uh, one might imagine we could overshoot uh, 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 the amount of carbon we could release for uh, a one and a half degree world with confidence um, and then bring emissions uh, uh, to a very extensive net negative scale, that's the gray on the second half of the century, in order to suck more carbon out of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere than is going in for a very extended period of time in order to overshoot and then bring emissions back down to a, um, to a 1.5 degree temperature world. Um, not shown here are the reductions that would need to also happen uh, in methane and uh, black carbon and nitrous oxides, for example, particularly deep reductions, not to zero, but 35% uh, percent or so by 2050 relative to 2010 uh, with black carbon and methane. Um, I just want to also highlight here that um, uh, all of these pathways, uh, including the, um, the ones which have no overshoot, have some extent of negative emissions technologies or approaches um, that they rely on. I'll come back to that in a moment after mid-century, assuming we have ways to bring some carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere at scale. Um, and to be very clear, the IPCC simply did not explicitly model um, another climate response that's now uh, a subject of considerable discussion, which is uh, the potential use of, of solar radiation management or measures to reflect sunlight citing, and I quote, uncertainties and knowledge gaps, this is from the Summary for Policymakers, as well as substantial risks, institutional and social constraints to development related to governance, ethics, and impact on sustainable development. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, but um, uh, we'll come back to that perhaps in the Q&A if people would be interested in doing so. Um, this is just uh, four illustrative pathways drawn from the slide I showed you before that the IPCC pulls out to characterize what an individual pathway might look like. Again, the gray are emissions from fossil fuels. The brown are emissions or uptake from land use change. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the yellow in each of these pathways are uh, carbon uptake from uh, another carbon dioxide removal technology, bioenergy, uh, coupled with carbon capture and storage technologies to um, uh, use a biomass to produce electricity and then store emissions from its production in permanent sites. Um, the reason why these two technologies were developed was simply because those were what uh, could readily be modeled in these pathways. Um, there are other approaches I'll allude to in a moment that are certainly under discussion, including uh, in this report. Um, so uh, again, all of these pathways imagining, and I want to use the emphasis on imagining, uh, the transition that we might need, we, we might feasibly make in order to uh, bring uh, CO2 emissions uh, essentially to zero by mid-century under almost any uh, conceivable scenario consistent with a one and a half degree world, coupled with the varying degrees of, uh, of carbon dioxide removal through a plausible range of technologies, some of which we uh, have at hand today, some of which we clearly don't, um, at substantial scale, roughly, again, sort of looking at the range of, of scenarios on something like an order of 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide removed per year on an annual basis in the second half of the century. So going from 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide emitted per year net to a net of 10 gigatons removed per year um, uh, on a 50 to 70 year uh, time scale. That's the, you know, the, this was the charge of the IPCC to help us figure out what we would need to do consistent with, uh, with, with these temperature targets. Um, no doubt ambitious, uh, no doubt challenging, uh, but nonetheless uh, targets that governments have committed to and that uh, clearly would need to be realized through a tremendous, as the IPCC highlights, uh, far-reaching uh, uh, rapid and far-reaching transitions in energy, land use, urban, and infrastructure, including transportation, at what the IPCC rightly characterizes as an unprecedented scale. Um, just to quickly uh, break out the notion of carbon dioxide. Actually, before I go here, let me just say that those, those transformations include, under almost all of these scenarios, 
um, for example, in the electricity sector, renewable energy going to about 80% of electricity production globally uh, by mid-century, uh, coal uh, going to essentially zero uh, as a source of electricity generation by that same timeline, recognizing, of course, that the longer we delay in reducing emissions towards zero, the larger the likelihood of exceeding uh, the one and a half degree target and the heavier the implied reliance on uh, negative emissions technologies. And the IPCC also highlights, again, important to note, that carbon dioxide removal deployed at scale is at the scale that's anticipated by these models. Um, unproven and reliance on technology is a major risk in our ability to limit warming to one and a half degrees. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences has just uh, uh, usefully come out with a report on carbon dioxide removal technologies that should inform our conversations about the kinds of research uh, uh, R&D that might be needed to um, explore whether and how technologies could be amplified at uh, con consistent with uh, being both feasible and cost effective. And this useful chart drawing on the IPCC report but published by Inside Climate News simply it characterizes based on in a broad strokes based on uh, current cost estimates, um, the scale of potential carbon storage in gigatons of CO2 per year that could be uh, 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 gained through a range of approaches to draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere from afforestation and reforestation to soil carbon sequestration, both things that uh, with photosynthesis we know how to do well, um, to technologies such as direct air capture um, that's being explored, um, but it's currently uh, wildly expensive relative to what might be cost effective in a, in a carbon constrained world. Um, uh, and, and, and just to note that the IPCC report, and I'm sorry not to go into this in more detail now in the interest of time, looks intentionally at um, both mitigation pathways, that is to say emissions reductions pathways, as well as carbon removal um, prospects and potentials um, through the lens of sustainable development. That is to say, it, it intentionally and rightly explores uh, the trade-offs and risks and uncertainties associated not just with uh, our ability to bring carbon out of the atmosphere or to reduce its input, but how the energy costs, water use, land use, uh, and other implications of bringing out these technologies, both ones we know and ones we uh, are just beginning to explore at scale, might bump up against, either be synergistic with or or challenged by the uh, other um, essential uh, demands we place on land, on water, on energy for our livelihoods, not just uh, in the industrialized world, but importantly in, in uh, across the developing world. And so that's a very important contribution of this report. Um, so let me now turn this back over for some closing comments on where we go from here from Alden Meyer. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, this, this report was not meant to sit on a shelf. It was obviously requested by the governments of the world, and it's going to be put to immediate use. I, I should say, having watched these reports since the formation of the IPCC back in 1989, 1990, I think this has gotten perhaps the most media coverage of any, perhaps because of the dire message and the challenge it outlines to the world, uh, but also because I think it connects with the extreme weather impacts that people are experiencing in countries all over the world. So it was released into uh, a very uh, receptive media environment. So the, I mentioned the facilitative dialogue that was called for in the Paris Agreement. Uh, Fiji and, and other countries across the Pacific have a tradition called Talanoa, which is a more collaborative and participatory process than we normally uh, see in the United Nations negotiations halls. And they've renamed the facilitative dialogue the Talanoa dialogue. Uh, they've been doing a, a pretty extensive phase under their presidency of the Conference of the Parties over the last year, a technical phase looking at three questions. Uh, where are we? Where do we need to go? And how do we get there? Uh, there have been literally hundreds of submissions from countries, states, cities, companies, think tanks, NGOs, uh, sharing their experiences uh, in trying to address the climate challenge. There was a day-long series of roundtables at the negotiations in Bonn, Germany last May, where negotiators and observers shared their stories and their experiences, both their successes and failures. I must say it was a very different atmosphere there than the, the formal negotiations themselves. Uh, the negotiators and, 
and NGOs and others were really relating to each other at a human level, uh, which gives us, I think, some hope. So at the climate summit that I mentioned in Katowice, Poland, uh, the first two weeks of December, uh, there will be a high-level ministerial dialogue, a political uh, discussion uh, on the uh, ambition gap between the collective uh, actions that countries have pledged to take and what's needed uh, to meet the Paris temperature goals. Uh, on December 11th and 12th, there will be uh, uh, both a presentation of the IPCC report, some other uh, plenary interventions, and then parallel roundtables of ministers and some corporate and NGO CEOs addressing just the third question in the Talanoa Dialogue, how do we get there, assuming that the IPCC report now that has been approved by the world's governments answers the first two questions of where are we and where do we need to go. Uh, the objective of this, from our point of view, is to anchor the outcome of this year-long Talanoa Dialogue process in a formal conference of the party's decision. Uh, together with a declaration by a, a coalition of the willing uh, group of countries about their political intention to address the ambition gap. We're hoping to build on the statement last June that was organized by the Marshall Islands and joined by 25 developed and developing countries that expressed uh, their willingness to explore more ambitious uh, commitments under Paris and also building on the carbon neutrality coalition that was launched by 19 countries from Europe, Latin America, Africa, and the Pacific region last month in New York City in conjunction with the opening of the General Assembly. Those countries, uh, accompanied by some 40 cities, uh, have committed themselves to develop long-term development strategies that transition to a net zero greenhouse gas emission climate resilient future. So there are some uh, hopeful signs out there, obviously not what we need yet. Uh, we don't have critical mass to bend those emissions curves in the way that, that Peter just showed you we need to. And one of the challenges, of course, is that the uh, presidency of the Conference of the Parties will be transitioning at the opening of this climate summit from Fiji to Poland. And for those who have followed the history of Poland in this process, they have been opposed to increasing the ambition of the European Union's uh, commitments and, and have not been uh, supportive of a of a bold and ambitious outcome on this, uh, on this Talanoa dialogue process. But we're working with a group of progressive uh, developed and developing countries to try to build momentum for the decisions and the commitments that we need. Uh, of course, this doesn't end at COP24, or the climate summit in, in Poland. Uh, next year, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, has announced he will hold a leaders summit in New York in conjunction with the opening of the General Assembly and we'll be pressing for leaders to make political commitments to enhance uh, the ambition of their Paris commitments by no later than 2020. Uh, the summit will also be looking in, a, in an organized way at initiatives in key sectors, uh, building on the outcomes of last month's uh, Global Climate Action Summit in California, uh, which was held at the subnational level, states, cities, businesses, and others. Uh, the Secretary General Summit will be looking in depth at energy transition, at the industrial sector, at nature-based solutions in, in food and agriculture and land use and forests, at cities and local action, at resilience and adaptation, and finally, at finance and, and investment. And the goal will be to identify one or two potential actions in each of these areas that will have the greatest impact and build support uh, for them. There's an active campaign underway by NGOs around the world to encourage countries to come to that summit next September with pledges of greater ambition. <clears throat> and of course, it will take uh, some coordinated action by, by China and the European Union in particular uh, to send the signals and build the broader coalition. But of course, each of those uh, countries and regions faces challenges. Uh, in Europe, there are splits between Western and Central and Eastern European countries and a, a growing lack of strong leadership. Uh, and in China, there's mounting concerns about economic slowdowns and trade wars. So uh, this is going to take some work to pull off. Of course, we are not expecting any sh shift in the Trump administration stance uh, by next September summit. But we will be continuing to work uh, to highlight US subnational action, uh, that we are still in an America's pledge effort uh, that combines states and cities and business action uh, 
to say that despite uh, the position of President Trump to withdraw the U.S. from the Paris Agreement, uh, uh, these players and entities intend to try to meet our pledges under Paris. And we're likely to see a number of newly elected governors uh, next week in, in some states across the country who will join the U.S. Climate Alliance of 17 states that is now committed uh, to meeting the U.S. emissions pledge under Paris. And just so one final slide for you is to remember to vote next week or early if you can. Uh, this is a billboard uh, outside of New Haven, Connecticut, uh, part of a series of billboards that we've been involved in placing around the country. We're really trying to say that science is on the ballot next week. Um, of course, we cannot tell you who to vote for, uh, but we can encourage you to examine candidates' records and their platforms and to support those who support science. I will also mention that there are some issues on the ballot which we can tell you about and encourage you to support. In, if you live in Washington State, there's a very important initiative to put a price on carbon uh, and to use the revenues for investments in a variety of, of, uh, of sectors in the state economy. And there are also ballot initiatives in Arizona and Nevada which would increase the renewable energy requirements in those states to 50 percent uh, by the year 2030. Uh, so if you live in one of those states, we encourage you to support uh, those initiatives. And with that, we'll close and open it up for your questions. Thank you, Alden, and thanks, everybody, for uh, uh, joining us through this discussion. If you have a question and you haven't yet um, put it in to the Q&A chat box, please do. Uh, and, uh, and we'll be happy to build this out as a conversation. Um, let me start with a couple of questions that are already on the table. One is just a very practical one about getting a copy of the slides. I believe that we can make those slides available, and we will follow up uh, shortly after the webinar to let folks know uh, exactly how that might happen. Um, there is a second question, uh, a very important one. Uh, I'll just read it. Several climatologists, including Mike Mann and others, have criticized this report as overly optimistic because they assume a larger carbon budget than much of the literature suggests is the case. What's the source of this discrepancy in the carbon budget? Uh, it's an important question. I, I, let me say a couple things about it. Um, uh, uh, I mean, as a general point, the report finds, as I think everybody knows, um, much greater climate risks at lower increases in global average temperature than had previously been reported. This is a, a function of the kind of the state of the science moving forward. It's not a cherry-picked notion of the literature. It's really the first time that models had been motivated, modelers had been motivated to look specifically at projections of one and a half to two, at the same time that both evidence and, and projections modeling work is identifying across a range of issues, many of which Rachel Licker touched on, um, uh, uh, greater changes already and greater risks than we had anticipated, including potentially quite catastrophic ones, such as ice sheet destabilization um, uh, at lower temperatures. So in that sense, it's very hard for me to imagine this report as being considered optimistic. Um, uh, the carbon budget is an interesting and complicated issue. I will, uh, uh, for the wonks among you, I'll show you this slide. Um, I'm not going to go into this in any detail. This is from chapter two of the report. I'll just say a couple things. Um, the amount of the carbon budget is basically how much carbon dioxide we have let to emit consistent with a, with a change in a goal with respect to global average temperature and a probability associated with staying below that temperature. Um, the core um, measure is something called the transient climate response uh, to cumulative carbon emissions, or the TCRE. Uh, and basically, that's a you know what we know is that the there's roughly a linear response, a linear increase in um, uh, 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 the uh, amount of global average temperature increase as a function of the amount of CO2 that's been emitted. That ratio, um, as we increase uh, in CO2 emissions, there's roughly a linear increase in the increase in global average temperature. The key question is, what's that slope? Uh, of that increase, and there's been a significant debate about this in the recent literature. Uh, Mike Mann's done important work on it. Miles Allen, who's one of the lead authors of the report, has done also important work on it. They've come to slightly different places, uh, and this is where the you know the findings of the report that we have roughly uh, well just you know 770 
uh, uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide remaining uh, for a 50% chance of staying below two degrees, at one and a half degrees C, which is the middle of the um, that midpoint of that of that center of that diagram, is um, you know we're currently emitting uh, 41 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. So you can do the math. Um, uh, and the report highlights a lot of uncertainties about that, both in terms of the probability of staying below uh, a given temperature target, and also uncertainties in, for example, how, mu how quickly we reduce methane and black carbon and nitrous oxide, what the feedbacks are likely to be with respect to emissions, for example, from warming permafrost, uh, and, and, and other uncertainties, all of which, or many of which, actually reduce, or rather, yeah, reduce the amount of remaining carbon we have. Um, so this will be an issue of considerable ongoing uh, discussion and debate in the expert community. Uh, and we'll see where we end up uh, in the sixth assessment report. I think no, whether the number is a little too low or a little too high, you know, we're not going to know until we get there, unfortunately. And the way to avoid having to know for sure is to dramatically reduce our emissions uh, consistent with at least the pathways that these are described. They obviously are heroic assumptions going into the emissions reductions pathways, uh, and they would be even more so if we uh, assumed a smaller carbon budget available than, than, than where this report landed. I hope that's a useful response to that question. Um, Rachel, do you want to pick up the question about what are the consequences to staying on the 3 degrees C plus track we're on now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. First, to say that 3 degrees C um, would roughly be equivalent to meeting the commitments that were made under the Paris Agreement. So certainly um, that, you know, where we are now in the current track of business as usual, um, if we just were, were emitting what we are now, it's actually higher than 3 degrees C. But if we're actually enabled to enact the measures that countries committed to within the Paris Agreement, um, then we could bring warming down lower uh, and closer to 3 degrees C. Um, so the consequences of uh, warming reaching that level, um, as I mentioned, a lot of the changes um, maybe aren't necessarily linear, but do follow you know, a progression of getting worse with increased warming, things like extreme heat. Uh, you know, here in the United States, we're likely to see at mid-century um, if we stay in a 3 degrees C warming track, I think an average of 20 to 30 uh, more days per year with temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit um, than recent levels. Um, and so, you know, that those figures would be lower, obviously, if we would achieve 1.5 or 2 degrees C warming or higher, if, uh, you know, if we kept on um, truly business as usual. Um, and so, yeah, many of the changes that I noted um, are, are going to be kind of progressing in that way with the getting worse with increased emissions and warming. Um, but there are certain changes that, um, you know, we'll see more of those irreversible changes coming online. So, you know, we would traverse above 2 degrees C and, and hitting 3 degrees C, the point at which warm water corals are likely to disappear. Um, and so, you know, we would see those kinds of irreversible impacts um, happening um, in greater uh, numbers. Um, and obviously the risk of uh, instabilities in the ice sheets being triggered would, would dramatically increase if we went past 2 degrees C up to 3 degrees C, um, which would then um, bring the possibility of the catastrophic sea level rise um, with, you know, which would mean very serious implications for our coastal communities. Um, uh, yeah, so so lots of different uh, things getting worse, obviously, at that level, um, and really highlights the importance of the need for countries to ramp up ambition um, through the Talanoa Dialogue and um, the associated other uh, aspects of COP uh, that Alden discussed. Um, so yeah, and and. Um, Peter, did you want to take it back with the other questions that are out there? Yeah, thank you, Rachel. So um, one more question here about uh, some of the report, while alarming, and it clearly is, is actually conservative, doesn't fully reflect the impacts of positive, uh, which is, say, self-reinforcing feedback in the Earth's climate system. Do you agree with these concerns? Let me, let me just tee this up, and perhaps others can weigh in. 
it certainly is alarming. There's no doubt about it. Um, uh, I would say that assessment reports, including by the IPCC, but other assessment reports by their very nature uh, have historically been conservative uh, relative to what uh, uh, projections have been realized. And that's been true of the IPCC with respect to historic estimates of sea level rise, for example, have underplayed the changes that we've actually seen. Um, uh, and you know, there's a there may be a couple reasons for this. It's obviously the assessment by its nature uh, needs to uh, uh, draw upon the peer-reviewed literature, the peer review, and there be a kind of peer-reviewed assessment of the of the assessment. Uh, and and the nature of peer review is a has it, peer review is a conservatizing uh, process. Um, and I think scientists, as a general rule, tend to climate scientists have tended to be, um, uh, you know, keep their heads down and not try not to be overly alarmist, even when the findings are truly alarming. There's, many of you will know about a paper that Naomi Oreskes and Mike Oppenheimer and others published a few years ago um, uh, that coined the phrase, erring on the side of least drama, um, the notion that uh, we have, as a community of climate scientists, tended to uh, project conservatively uh, estimates uh, such as on sea level rise as they actually turned out to be the case. So whether or not this report has underplayed uh, positive feedbacks, I think you know we we don't know enough about, for example, the ice sheet dynamics associated with destabilization uh, to have high confidence in under what temperature increases, for example, those will play out. Um, and so I think it's certainly possible that it's like its predecessors conservative, but I think. Uh, you know, we will have to look back on this in a few years in order to have a, a better sense of that. Rachel or anybody else, Alden, do you want to uh, amplify uh, or, or alter that comment? No, thanks. I think that was great. Any good yeah, news I in think, the report? Oh, go ahead, Alden. I'm sorry. No, I think I think that's right, and uh, and that's traditionally been a, a a hallmark of the IPCC process since its formation. Uh, you know, more than almost 20 years ago. So. Or almost 30 years ago now, so that's that's a there is inherent conservatism in it, and, and unfortunately, that's not always uh, understood by policymakers and and the public about the fact that uh, uh, actually uh, uh, the report may be understating uh, some of the impacts that we could face if we don't change direction. So, with respect to the important question about any good news in the report about the availability of technologies and strategies to achieve the transformation that's needed, and of course harkens back to the title of this uh, presentation about facing the future, uh, you know, climate future with courage. Um, uh, so I think we can all take a, a quick whack at, at, at this. There clearly has been uh, a range of changes that we've seen with respect to um, emissions reductions technologies, renewable energy technologies, and their scalability, their price. Um, uh, that have uh, surprised us as a community, that is to say the price of wind and solar, for example, uh, as characterized in this report, and rightly so, have come down faster than anybody, certainly in the economics community, broadly expected, uh, as one then brings those into integrated assessment models um, and other opportunities to look forward. They enable uh, greater reductions in emissions and their scaling uh, than uh, we would have done a few years ago. Um, so that's clearly uh, good news. Um, the dedicated discussion around technologies associated with carbon dioxide removal, those both that we know now uh, and that we may need to sort out, I think is very healthy. Um, as I mentioned, the Academy, National Academies have just come out with an important report that in many ways builds on where the IPCC report um, leaves off um, to look at where we can further our understanding of these technologies and their cost effectiveness and trade-offs associated with um, further investments in R&D. Um, you know, but the, the, the core news in this report, as it really always has been on climate change, really dating back to the, um, you know, the, the, the 1990 um, starting point of the emissions trajectory that I showed you and the conversations that ensued with the first IPCC assessment and the Rio meetings and so on, is that by and large this is really about political will, right? Um, that the transformation that we need and the strategies to achieve it are, by and large, um, achievable, by and large, most of the way, with things we already know how to do 
um, uh, and that we as communities of citizens um, concerned, as Alden highlighted, about facts mattering in our political world, um, not just in the US, but globally, um, have both the opportunity and the need to really ensure that um, that political will is realized, because that is the that it's not about a particular technology, it's not about a particular solution, it's about um, uh, ensuring that that uh, uh, that politicians elected uh, not just in the U.S. but internationally are uh, are hearing uh, what citizens uh, believe to be needed, and one hopes that this report, as we think, really got a lot of attention, much more so than a typical IPCC report has. Um, will be part of the process of galvanizing the essential attention and political will that the report also highlights is needed. Um, Alden or Rachel, do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, and I think the IPCC really <clears throat> does put the ball back in the policymakers' court, which is, of course, uh, what it was intended to do. In addition to the political challenge, though, I think the report also underscores sort of the institutional uh, challenges that we face. It, it makes clear that we need not incremental change, but exponential change, and how uh, unprecedented that is in transitions in the energy system, for example, uh, where it generally takes decades to achieve the, the kind of uh, shifts in technology, or sometimes even a century, that we need to see uh, in years um, to make the, the transition we need. So. I think that's going to be a, a ripe area for discussion. It's clearly been taken to heart by uh, the advisory team that we're working with with the Secretary General's uh, office and, and looking at, at what would be some of the transformational actions or investments that could really trigger that exponential scale of deployment of clean technologies and, and changes in some of the underlying sectors. So I think that's really where, where the focus needs to be now. Um, you know, clearly uh, uh, we're not on the path we need to be on. I think the public is, is waking up to that, and uh, <clears throat> we're certainly seeing that in this country and also, I think, around the world uh, with the impacts we've seen in recent years. But um, there needs to be a, a message of, of concrete hope about, about how we can get off of that pathway and onto some of the lower pathways that Peter, Peter described earlier. And I think that's the challenge for all of us. Uh, going forward on the basis of this report. So we are uh, nearing the end of our hour. Um, I'm a little hesitant to add on more. There are a couple more questions. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, I'm, I, just, I think I, we should probably close now. Um, so forgive me for not uh, picking up on these last questions, given the time we're in, just to respect people's uh, time. Um, uh, uh, we will follow up with respect to the core question at the beginning about getting access to the slides. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for their joining us uh, for this webinar. Uh, and I wanted to close by, uh, I'm not going to go back to this slide, but the one that Alden showed about voting, um, because that's where the rubber meets the road with respect to the political will uh, that we all uh, need to see realized. Um, so with that, thank you again for joining us, and uh, we appreciate your collaboration with us on the UCS Science Network. Thank you.